Uh, my name is Craig Johnson. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, my name is Craig Johnson. I'm one of the graduate students involved with the Center for Right-Wing Studies. Uh, I'm here at the History Department at Cal Berkeley. Uh, I'm a third year and I, sp I uh, specialize in the right-wing in Latin America, specifically Argentina and Chile. And I'm here to introduce our panelists today. And so the format that we're going to be following is as follows. Uh, I will introduce all of the speakers uh, and then they will come up and speak in turn. Uh, throughout the panel's discussions, uh, you will be writing questions that you may have on the note cards that should be that should have been on the chairs that you sat down on. Uh, throughout the discussion, if you have a question, please raise it. Uh, it will be picked up by one of us involved with the center circulating around. Uh, those questions will then be recirculated to me at the end of the discussion to ask to the panelists. Uh, questions can be directed to individual panelists or to a wider discussion. Okay. So uh, I will start with the introductions of our panelists, and uh, you'll have to excuse me. Uh, I am a young person, so I'm using a telephone instead of a piece of paper. Uh, uh, so we'll begin. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers in the order that they will be speaking today. Uh, first, we have Professor Lowell Bergman, uh, Director of the Investigative Reporting Program and the Reverend Donald Logan Distinguished Chair in Investigative Journalism at the Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, here at University of California, Berkeley, uh, where he has had a seminar dedicated to investigative reporting for over 20 years. He was a senior producer and consultant to PBS Frontline until 2015. In 2004, Professor Bergman received the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, uh, awarded the New York Times for a dangerous business, uh, which detailed a, f uh, a foundry company's safety and environmental violations. For 20 few years, uh, Bergman was a producer in the network television news including 14 at CBS's 60 Minutes. Professor Bergman has received numerous Emmys and other awards, including six Alfred L. DuPont Columbia University Silver and Gold Batons, three Peabody's, and a Polk Award. Uh, after Professor Bergman, uh, we will have uh, Professor Simon. Uh, Professor Simon joined the Berkeley Law Faculty in 2003 and teaches criminal law and advanced, commercial, and advanced criminal law seminar on mass incarceration, sociology of law, and several classes in the undergraduate legal studies program. Uh, his scholarship focuses on the role of crime and criminal justice in governing contemporary societies. <coughs> and his past work includes two award-winning monographs, uh, one entitled Poor Discipline, Parole and the Social Control of the Underclass, and another entitled Governing Through Crime, How the War on Crime Transformed American Democracy and Created a Culture of Fear. Our final presenter for this panel uh, will be Professor Bertrand Ross. Uh, Professor Ross's interests are driven by a normative concern about democratic re responsiveness and a methodological approach that integrates political theory and empirical social science into discussions of legal doctrine, the institutional role of courts, and democratic design. Prior to joining the law school here, uh, Professor Ross was a Kellis Parker Academic Fellow at Columbia Law School and has clerked for the Honorable Dorothy Nelson of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Honorable, Honorable Myron Thompson of the Middle District of Alabama. So, without further ado, we'll begin today's panel uh, with Professor Bergman. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, congratulations on all of you for finding this building. <laughs> I must say, I've got my workout this morning going up and down the hill. And, um, for a symposium that we're having at, uh, at the investigative reporting program, I just wanted to share with you our little memento for the symposium, and I brought it along to identify myself. It says, enemy of the people. Um, and because um, I'm a member of the press, and it's a press gathering. And uh, to begin, uh, while it was nice to hear all my awards, I thought I'd sent a little two-line thing that said I was a professor of, investi of investigative reporting at the University of California Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, where I run the investigative reporting program. I'm also a veteran and began in this business almost 50 years ago in 1969, and I was a, um, a founder of a small newspaper in San Diego, California. Uh, that was a response to the propaganda being put out to, uh, by the local daily newspaper, the San Diego Union Tribune, uh, the actions of the governor, Ronald Reagan, and some right-wing vigilante organizations that were attempting to physically remove my thesis advisor, 
Herbert Marcuse from the faculty at the university. So I, ra I raised all that as part of my introduction because in, before coming here, I started thinking about, yes, we could talk about Donald Trump, the clown, or, Don, or uh, Carter Page, his representative apparently uh, to Russia, and, and various other people who are, seem to be made out of fiction. And none of this seems to be real. And I thought it was important, uh, and I've done this with students at, at the graduate school, to reflect really at this point, um, right after the election, about what are we really dealing with? And what is, the, what is the background, what is the perspective that maybe will get us through this? First of all, today, the uh, Committee to Protect Journalists uh, announced that uh, they were holding a press conference in Veracruz, Mexico, because 50 Mexican journalists and media representatives have been assassinated in Mexico since 2010. That is not happening here. We are not talking about that kind of emergency. Nor are we talking about the kind of emergency that existed when we started this newspaper in San Diego. In those days, Richard Nixon, who may be the only predecessor to Donald Trump, whose language at certain points matches, for instance, a direct verbal attack on the press, the press seen as the enemy, the nattering nabobs of negativism, etc., the press being targeted by the IRS and by others for retribution, as we know now from the recordings, as opposed to speeches by Donald Trump, the deep hatred that he, he and his associates had for the press. So we have had predecessors. We've had predecess a predecessor in his case who was already armed with the internal security apparatus that had been created in this country during the Cold War. And that apparatus was turned loose on dissenters and, and uh, protesters and portions of the press. So we're not in that kind of situation. We're not in the situation in, in, in response to our newspaper in San Diego. We didn't get sued. We went to jail. We were arrested regularly. 120 of our uh, street sellers of newspapers were picked off the street by the police, and we actually filed suit against the police for doing that, blocking the sidewalk, et cetera, et cetera. We were firebombed. We had drive-by shootings. So we're not in that kind of press situation around the First Amendment, nor are we in a, in a situation legally around the First Amendment where there is a direct attack on our privileges in the courts at this point, in part because uh, conservative elements in the court, along with uh, their supporters outside it, have, success have successfully established the rule that the business community has free speech, unfettered free speech. It's called business free speech. And because of Citizens United, money has free speech. And within that context, we survive. For example, uh, two years ago at one of our, at our symposium, uh, a, a Wall Street billionaire and short seller on a panel discussing, uh, to boil it all down, the Chinese gambling capital of Macau and how it was the source of wealth for Sheldon Adelson and Steve Wynn, the largest contributor of the Republican Party this year and also the chairman of the Republican Finance Committee, um, how they accumulate, became mega rich. And because of his comments on that panel, for the first time in the history of the University of California, a panelist and an academic gathering was sued for defamation in the federal district court in Northern California by Steve Wynn for his remarks. Uh, because we have great statutes in California, slap statutes and other statutes that defend journalism and free speech. Um, the federal district court here twice in the, in the course of five months threw the case out. And just recently the Ninth Circuit, which I believe we have a veteran of here, uh, also threw it out. But he'll probably take it to the Supreme Court. So because we have these protections, we're not really in danger of being repressed by the law, at least at this point. And I don't think anyone that I know who's a practitioner uh, and uses the First Amendment daily feels that way about what's going on. I think we're facing a different kind of question, uh, a question that has to do, uh, and it's going to take a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, uh, and that the precedent for it goes back um, a, a number of years before Nixon's presidency. And that is, is that we have under the law and by common practice, 
opened up what I would call pure tolerance. That was my, my, what my uh, thesis advisor called it in a book, a little book he did called The Critique of Pure Tolerance. And what does that mean? That means we allow any kind of speech equal, equal rights, equal uh, ability to ex be expressed, and we defend it. It's a, virtue, it's, a, it's a virtue that I would like to say that I support with, without reservation. The problem is it's, it shouldn't be true, and it isn't true. We know by Supreme Court decisions that you cannot yell fire in a, in a theater, in a crowded theater. We know, that, we know that there are certain forms of speech that were restricted, particularly when they were on the public airwaves. Many of you may not remember that at one time, in order to hold a license, and this is the key problem right now, in order to hold a license to use the public airwaves, you had to operate like a public utility under the, under the Federal Communications Act of 1934, I think it is. 33? Four, yeah. Okay. Yeah, a fact checker. You actually had to use facts on the air. You could be held accountable by the community. They could come to your front door of your, of your broadcast station and fill in in a book a complaint. And at the end of every year, or I don't remember the exact period, but I believe it was once a year, uh, investigators from the Federal Communications Commission would come and see what kinds of complaints had been filed. You had the right of reply. You couldn't use personal attack. And if you, if that's someone you put on the air. And if you were the license holder, you had to give equal time to someone to reply. You couldn't have done what Donald Trump just did with the networks and the cable TV and the internet, public airwaves, without going out of business. Because you'd look at all the people you'd have to let on to reply, from the people who, the, for the disabled, to politicians, to all these other people. Now, why did we have these rules? I'll get to that in a minute. But the fact is, these rules, the definition of the public interest in broadcasting and that it, that it related to certain, certain regulations by the FCC, which were upheld by the Supreme Court when they were challenged, that these certain rules were, most of them, removed in 1985 when the public interest was redefined by the Reagan administration as what the public is interested in. <laughs> and now, let me give you a quiz, since it's, uh, we're at the university. Why is 60 Minutes on at 7 o'clock on Sunday? You watch 60 Minutes? No. 60 Minutes started in 1968, and it moved around from time period to time period until 1973. There, was a, there is, today, an FCC regulation, still in effect, it was not repealed, that said that at least one hour of primetime broadcasting on Sunday evenings, at a, and they, did, they declared that there were four hours, seven o'clock to 10, that's primetime on Sunday. Other days, it's eight to, uh, to 10. One hour had to be uh, de dedicated to, to programming in the public interest. Had to be children's programming, documentaries, could be sports, depends, that's never been tested. But it couldn't be profit-making entertainment that went to the lowest common denominator. You had to live up to a certain standard. So in 1973, 60 Minutes went on 7 o'clock in Sundays, and the ratings went way up because there was nothing else to watch. <laughs> and nobody could ever find anything to compete with it for that time slot. And when I was there for 14 years, they would often, we'd have discussions in New York about why are we in the top 10? And the, uh, the competition would say, because you have a protected time period. We would try to come up, or the boss would try to come up with all kinds of things. We have great correspondence, he's a genius, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a large part of it. And that habit was then carried on. And you couldn't. I was an executive for a while at ABC News in charge of investigations. I sat in the inner sanctum meetings where when the discussion of repealing the equal time rules and everything else of fairness doctrine were being discussed and lobbying was going on in Washington. And the executives were ecstatic that they'd finally not have to put 17 candidates on and give them all equal time in an election. 
which you may have seen in the photo today in the New York Times in France they have to do. So I'm, I'm saying that as background. Now where that comes to, and what I'm going to leave you with, uh, and by the way, uh, I don't have time to read it to you, but you may want to go back and uh, write down the name Newton Minow, M-I-N-O-W. He's currently 91 years old. I talked with him the other day. Um, and we discussed his famous speech where he had declared in the early 1960s that he had sat and watched all of broadcast television uh, for a week and decided that it was a, quote, vast wasteland. He was the commissioner of FCC, and he, he well, let me just read this pretty quickly. He addressed the National Association of Broadcasters, and he said, this is in 61, and he said, your industry possesses the most powerful voice in America. It has an inescapable duty to make that voice ring with intelligence and with leadership. In a few years, this exciting industry has grown from a novelty to an instrument of over overwhelming impact on the American people. Sound like the internet? I would suggest to you that the current struggle is going to be over how we bring, there's not going to be any legislation, there's not going to be any public policy, as Newton Minow said to me uh, the other day that's going to happen in the near future to bring the internet under control. The only way it's going to be happening, and you may look this up in a Toe Center, Columbia Toe Center report that just came out, is going to be, have to be public pressure on the providers, the oligopoly that controls the platforms, to actually operate within their own standards and practices. Donald Trump violated the standards and practices of Twitter. He does it all the time. They don't enforce it. And until that happens, the, re the, e the education of the American public, which has given us this presidency, and various other things that have rolled back reforms, rolled back reality, will continue. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I would like to begin just with a moment of silen silence for Liddell Lee, uh, a man in Arkansas who was uh, killed by the state last night in a, a sham uh, spectacle of ridiculous uh, lawyering and delawyering uh, after spending something like 27 years uh, in prison uh, for a crime he may not have committed. But even if he did, he spent 23 or 7 years in prison and then was dragged to his death uh, essentially in a a crazed spectacle, which some of you may have followed in terms of uh, the courts and the efforts to stop it. So let's just take a, a, a minute to, to, to remember the humanity that has been lost. Thank you. I want to note, although I won't be talking a lot about sort of constitutional law in the canonical sense, that it's far from clear that this is a, a case where uh, Trump's victory would have made a difference. If Merrick Garland had been sitting uh, on the court, given what we know about his record, even though he's a moderate liberal on many issues, uh, he's not on the death penalty in particular, and I suspect he would have voted to uphold this execution. For many of the things I'm going to refer to, the, the person you need to watch is uh, Anthony Kennedy, our own California justice, who's very old now, 85, something like that who might feel comfortable retiring under Trump, uh, by which he would immediately abandon everything he's accomplished in terms of his dignity, jurisprudence, and I'll be talking about. But keep your eye on him on, in terms of the, the number counting. <clears throat> so I want to make five points if I can get them out. I'm a criminologist, so I'll, I'll, I'll lean on the side of order rather than coherence and, and follow the young man here with the, the time. So my first point is that I think we need to think about the Trump campaign and the victory to the extent that we can treat an accidental event uh, uh, as something that we can actually analyze or theorize, but I think the campaign is not an accident, it was very important, it has to be seen in terms of a severe crisis of legitimacy of the carceral state right now in the United States. Policing, the prison system, the prosecution system increasingly is under enormous attack, the most severe crisis of legitimacy since the 60s, basically, in terms of the confrontation. What kind of things am I talking about? Obviously the Black Lives Matter movement which uh, has, I think, had a profound impact already on American thinking across the board. If you look at the poll numbers on uh, whether people see the police as racially biased, uh, whether they think that they're being benefited by the kind of policing, those numbers are, uh, they've gone up and down in the last couple of years, but they're at historic lows. You have to go back to the Rodney King 
beating incident, which was a unique moment that momentarily kind of uh, withdrew the blinders uh, from the eyes of the American public about that. But it's not just the, the, the social movement. That's critical, too. Uh, if you look at our prison system, it has very recently lost the protection it had from the Supreme Court for over 20 years, where basically from 1979 or 81 on, prisons were basically allowed to, to pack in as many prisoners as they wanted so long as the torture didn't get too visible. And it took California's notoriously overcrowded and uh, uh, medically vulnerable prisons with full of uh, people suffering severe chronic illnesses to bring the Supreme Court uh, to a level of disgust, literally, that finally ca caused them to, to order California to effectively end mass incarceration. And I'll come back to California in a minute. Now, the causes of this legitimacy crisis are many, and it's a lot of what my scholarship is focused on now. Let me just give you one feel for it, because we've gotten so much great scholarship recently from historians, Elizabeth Hinton's book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, James Foreman's brand new book uh, uh, on sort of how the war on crime played out in Washington, D.C., a majority black city. Uh, obviously, the great Michelle Alexander's uh, work and building on the legacy of people like my teacher, Troy Duster. We have understood the rise of mass incarceration and punitive policing since the 60s in a way as an alliance between two unholy constitutional ideas, color blindness, the idea that we can have a white dominated, secured, publicly secured, policed spatial order as long as it's formally colorblind and that we uh, are engaged in a war on crime uh, to which our very civilization is at stake. Uh, and that is something that if you're not a baby boomer, it may seem like a really bizarre idea, but, but read my book, Governing Through Crime, because uh, for the generation that came of age in that period and, and really until the millennial generation, that sense that uh, 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 American spaces were under a kind of zombie apocalypse of crime to which we could not look too hard at policing or prisons lest we lose our safety. So that unholy alliance has come apart for a variety of interesting reasons that we could talk about, but I want to move on. My second point is that Trump cannot resolve this crisis. There's nothing uh, that Trump can do with the powers that he has in Washington to essentially resolve the, this larger crisis. And, but note that his campaign was very much built on, uh, on addressing that crisis to, it, to the core constituencies. I mean, in many ways, Trump's crime rhetoric was essentially a campaign for the blue vote, and he got that overwhelmingly. Police officers, correctional officers, ICE officers all over the country. I don't know if there ever was a poll of that, but I think it would show you know, virtual unanimity. Uh, and in states like my former home of Florida, that can have a lot of effects on suppressing other people's votes, but we won't get into that. My main point is that while Trump can't resolve this, he can do a lot to build up the sense that reform is too dangerous. And I think that's what you're going to see coming out of uh, Sessions' uh, Justice Department, a constant focus on a crime de jour, especially if it involves uh, immigrants, uh, in order to keep the reform forces, which I think overall have the balance of power, if we look at it, are unstable and unpredictably positioned. My third point is that I think Trump's biggest impact and the place that we need to focus most in terms of the criminal justice, what I, I prefer to think of is called a carceral state because criminal justice has the word justice in it, where the institutions I'm talking about don't for the most part and also because it is the state we're talking about, so if you, if you bear that bit of jargon. Trump's biggest impact on the shape of the carceral state is through his war on immigrant populations. And this uh, is in some ways comparable to Nixon's war on drugs. Uh, it, it's an opportunity to use federal powers, which in the criminal sphere are rel still relatively narrow in their own way. M vast majority of the carceral state is at the state and local level, something I want to come back to. But through empowering ICE, expanding it, he can grow the carceral state and he can empower those existing elements. All over the country, some police departments are intertwining with this resurgent ICE force. And of course, he's also giving them enormous cultural authority, the sort of Giuliani time moment for these, uh, these constituencies, which are very real. My fourth point, and now I'm getting to what I hope will be a more upbeat uh, theme, is that the most effective way that we can contest this war and the most important way that we can sort of see the constitutional uh, rights that we have not just as a defensive force uh, uh, to protect ourselves against an authoritarian Trump state, but actually as a, as a weapon to be used to try to push back against that 
is the growing uh, jurisprudence of dignity that I mentioned uh, a while ago. It's interesting that Anthony Kennedy, a Reagan appointee, has become so associated with things like uh, single-sex marriage or same-sex marriage in the Obergefell case. He wrote the Brown versus Plata opinion, which called California's prisons uncivilized and demanded uh, the massive drop in our prison population. And I think that the uh, the politics of a, a dignity campaign. I was just watching some documentaries of King's campaigns uh, uh, in Birmingham and elsewhere. And dignity is all over uh, his rhetoric, almost as powerful as his talk about uh, uh, equality. I'm struck by uh, something that Van Jones likes to say. Uh, he says, the opposite of criminalization is not decriminalization, it's humanization. We actually have to, as a social movement and as lawyers, go out there and humanize the people who are being killed, excluded, deported uh, from our country. It was King's great line was, we have to lift our nation from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity, he called it. So I think a dignity campaign, we have to have something we're for in this campaign against Trump. We're not just against Trump. For instance, we can have a reasonable debate about what kind of immigration policy we want as a nation. We can't have a reasonable debate about dragging mothers and fathers away from their children in the middle of the night. That is not what a dignified uh, society engages in, no matter what its uh, policies are. My final point is that California can lead right now. The same election that brought Trump to power brought California its uh, most liberal uh, legislative body in probably 40 years. As you know, it, they can vote now without a single Republican vote. More importantly, on the issues that are relevant to the carceral state, there is the biggest change of thinking uh, in Sacramento that I have seen in, you know, I kind of rose with mass incarceration as a graduate student of, of Troy Duster's trying to figure out what was going on out there. And in Sacramento was a solid wall of build more prisons, fill them. It was a bipartisan alliance that worked well for 40 years to, as Ruthie Gilmore explored, solve the complexities of California's uh, surpluses and deficits in those decades. Things have changed. This is the biggest change opportunity. And those legislators are incredibly responsive uh, to what's going on in the, the streets and in the community. So I would love to see that. By the time we get Trump out of office, we actually need a whole vision for the country about what kind of society we can be. And when it comes to criminal justice, California could be a perfect spot for that. We were the Mississippi of mass incarceration. We were the state that in many ways went farther than any other state in creating degrading uh, and dangerous and violent prisons. We have now had, and thanks to Brown versus Plata, the, the largest drop in uh, essentially prison population in correctional history. It has not gone nearly far enough. It is still blinded by assumptions about, quote, violent crime and unviolent crime. There are going to be tens of thousands of aging prisoners in our prisons experiencing extraordinary degrading conditions unless we actually massively change most of the laws that still politicians are afraid to change. But if you look at where voters are, and particularly millennials, and that's where I really want to end, because as you know, if millennials have been the only voters, uh, Hillary would have won easily, Brexit would have lost. In England, uh, generational change is not as fast as sometimes we would like it to be. But one of the things that keeps me going is being able to teach millennials every day uh, and feel the power that they're coming to Trump with. Uh, and we should join them. Those of us that are from those earlier generations uh, should be out there with them. And let me just close now so we can leave some time for our discussion. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning to you all. Um, it's great to see such a wonderful turnout at this event. I guess it shows how anxious we all are that we're here on a Friday morning in April and uh, finals are around the corner for some of us and uh, there's many things going on in life. So I appreciate, I want to first express my appreciation to Emily Bruce and, and uh, Larry Rosenthal with respect to organizing this conference and for inviting me to take part. So these 100 days, for me, have felt like a 1,000. Um, there have been so many twists and turns that have gone on during this 100 days. Uh, with each morning, I read the newspaper with great anticipation and trepidation, as I'm sure something has occurred. Now, yet so much has happened, and yet nothing at all. Travel ban has been issued targeting um, persons from predominantly Muslim countries and has been enjoined. 
It has been reissued again and then joined again. The long-awaited replace and repeal, uh, repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act, that horrific piece of injustice, abomination of socialized medicine, has been proposed and rejected by a House dominated by Republicans. Tax reform has been put forward and pulled back. Maybe something will be passed in August, maybe December, maybe not at all. And then there's that beautiful wall to be built along the southern border. No sign of a deal with Mexico to pay for it yet but bids from contractors have been accepted. Perhaps we would get resolution on the wall and how it will be paid for during the impending debate about raising the debt ceiling, or perhaps we won't. Now, there, despite the lack of results um, from the Trump, Trump administration, our democracy and our politics seem to have changed in fundamental ways. Communities of immigrants are under attack. Minority communities are being denied the police reform that was once promised to them. The choice of women with respect to reproduction and their reproductive autonomy is under threat. Now I'm going to focus my remarks today on what has happened, and yet nothing at all, on the realm, in the realm of voting rights. Um, and in and, and, and this realm, um, despite the lack of actual action that has any sort of consequential, tangible results, um, the effects of what's going on in the voting rights realm is changing our democracy and our politics in fundamental ways. Now, just after t taking office, um, President Trump tweeted a claim that as many as 3 million to 5 million people voted illegally in the November election. Now, such illegal voting cost him the popular vote that he lost to Hillary Clinton by 3 million votes. A few weeks later, Trump uh, claimed that he and former Senator Kelly Ayotte would have won their elections in New Hampshire if not for the thousands of people who were brought in on buses from neighboring Massachusetts to illegally vote in New Hampshire. Trump vowed to set up a White House commission to pursue his accusation of election fraud. But nothing yet has materialized on that front. Again, that whole thing of uh, so much has happened yet nothing at all. The commission has been announced, and many, but many, and many of those cons many of those concerned act, uh, conservative activists, those conservative activists that are concerned about voter fraud, have yet to be asked to participate on such a commission, suggesting that no commission is even in the works. Now, top Republicans in Congress, furthermore, have not pursued any action. House Oversight Committee Chairman Jason Chavitz. Chaffetz said that his panel would not pursue an investigation of voter fraud because he has not seen any evidence of voter fraud. Now, this lack of action on President Trump's claim of voter fraud might arise from the fact that there is a strong likelihood that any investigation of voter fraud would yield nothing or very little. Justin Levitt, an election law expert at Loyola, Loyola University Law School down in Los Angeles, found that only 31 cases of in-person fraud were recorded from 2000 to 2014. And if a Republican-led investigation of voter fraud turned up little, it would be a substantial setback for Republicans, as they would be less able to rely on claims of voter fraud to support restrictive voting laws. Voting laws. And instead, such efforts to restrict voting rights would be seen more clearly in a much more negative partisan light. Now, I'm not one to buy into the whole method to his madness idea with regards to pre President Trump's um, claims of voter fraud in the 2016 election. I think that the origin of President Trump's claim of voter fraud that cost him the election can be found in Trump's own insecurities. It truly gnaws at him that he lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton, and he wants to do whatever he can to delegitimize the result. And I think that his rather aggressive early fundraising push for the 2020 election is about simply proving that he could win the popular vote if he wants to. Now, despite the minimal evidence of voter fraud, a February poll found that one in four voters believed that Trump's claim that millions of voters were illegally, mil millions of votes were illegally cast in the 2016 election. But interestingly, 35% of those voters, who, those voters who believed Trump's claim said it was more likely that voter fraud benefited Trump, while 30% said they thought it benefited Clinton. Now, why do people believe in voter fraud claims despite the minimal evidence? And I think it can be explained by our geographic polarization. We are more likely to live and interact with similarly ideologically minded people than at any time in recent history. And what that feeds is a perception that those who think like us and share our partisan preferences are more numerous than they actually are in our polity. So it seems unfathomable to ideological opponents when George Bush, Barack Obama, or Donald Trump wins the presidency. 
it must have been won on the basis of some misdeed or rigging of the election. For liberals, the culprit has been voter suppression, and most recently, the Russians. The reason why Bush won in Ohio in 2004 and Donald Trump won in North Carolina was due to voter suppression efforts related to voter ID laws or intimidation at the polls. And the only way that Donald Trump won, period, at all, because of, was because of the Russians. Some liberals tell themselves that though these are the only ways that these Republicans could have won because most people in this country would vote for the Democrat if they could. For conservatives, the typical culprit has been voter fraud. The reason why Obama won in, in 2012 and Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in 2016 was due to fraudulent voting by felons, non-citizens, and dead people, or people like Massachusetts voters voting twice. Some conservatives tell themselves that is the only way these Democrats could have won because le most legitimate voters in this country would vote Republican. Now, the effects of allegation of widespread voter fraud without uh, uh, widespread voter fraud are real. Such allegations erode confidence in our elections, reduce turnout among marginal voters. Now, this is a bit odd since the conventional wisdom about the 2016 elections that Trump owed his victory to marginal voters. But another effect is to mobilize private and government monitoring of elections, which could lead to and contribute to intimidation and suppression of voters in low-income minority communities that tend to vote Democratic. A third effect is public support for laws ostensibly designed to redress voter fraud that either target low-income and minority communities or are designed to reduce turnout. For example, in response to Trump's claim of voter fraud arising from people being bused in from Massachusetts to vote in the New Hampshire election, the Republic, Republican controlled New Hampshire legislature has in introduced at least 40 bills in the 2017 legislative session that would make it harder to vote. The proposed legislation includes ending same day registration and restricting voting rights to only residents of New Hampshire who plan to live in the state for the indefinite future, which could prevent college students and military personnel from voting. Aside from New Hampshire, the Brennan Center for Justice has found that 21 states mostly controlled by Republicans, have introduced 46 bills designed to make it harder to vote. 12 of the states are considering stricter voter ID legislation. Virginia and Texas have introduced legislation that would create strict documentary, documentary proof of citizenship requirements to vote. Connecticut, Illinois, Iowa, and New Hampshire have introduced legislation to, eliminate or eliminate, to limit or eliminate election day registration. Arizona, Maine, and New Hampshire have introduced legislation designed to restrict the ability of students to claim residency and vote where they live and go to school. Finally, Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, and Texas have introduced legislation designed to reduce early voting opportunities. Now, beyond the president and his claims of voter fraud in the 2016 election and its effect on mobilizing states to act by introducing restrictive voting re voter legislation, Congress has also entered the election reform game. In the House, the, legis the leg legislation has been introduced to eliminate the Election Am Assistance Commission, a commission created by Congress after the 2000 election to upgrade voter technology and to provide election-related information to federal entities, state officials, and election administrators. Legislation has also been introduced in the House to terminate the federal public financing system, which provides major presidential nominees lump sum grants in the general election if the candidate agrees not to raise additional funds. Now, these uh, pieces of legislation have so far only gone through committees in the House, and maybe they will come to naught as uh, many of the things have been proposed so far, um, but they do represent a threat to um, the types of election for reform designed to liberalize voting or to make voting easier and also to address the challenges posed by our campaign finance system. Now, the courts thus far have acted as the only major counterweight to these regressive election laws. The legal challenge to Texas Senate Bill 14, which imposes a strict voter ID law, has a detailed and complex history that precedes the election of Donald Trump, but for which the 100 days of Donald Trump has implicated. Now, this history involves a successful suit in 2012 to block implementation of the Texas voter ID law under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. The next year, of course, the court in Shelby County Beholder rendered Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act inoperable. Within hours, Texas announced that it would implement Texas Senate Bill 14, which was the strict voter ID law. 
A lawsuit was then brought challenging the law under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and the United States Constitution, in particular the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. In October 2014, Federal District Court Judge uh, uh, in Texas found that um, SB 14, Senate Bill 14, violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because it imposed an unconstitutional burden on the right to vote and it was passed with an intent to discriminate on the basis of race. Days later, the Federal Court of Appeals, however, tempor temporarily stayed the district court order and Texas was granted permission to implement its photo ID law for the 2014 election. Then in August 2015, a three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals unanimously uh, affirmed the federal trial court's earlier finding that Texas voter ID law had a dis racially discriminatory effect in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. But they sent the issue down as to whether it has a discriminatory intent to the district court for more findings. Now, a lot happened with respect to this bill in the 2016 election. The Texas voter ID law was in place in some places, it seemed, and not in place in others. There's a lot of confusion surrounding whether the Texas voter ID law applied. But what's relevant to the first 100 days is that after the election, the Trump Department of Justice sought to, sought, sought to stop the review of the law in the district court by requesting to withdraw the Obama administration's claim that the law was enacted with a discriminatory intent. The Trump administration argued that the Texas legislature should be allowed to amend the law, which meant removing any taint of discriminatory intent by scrubbing the record before the courts resolved the question. The federal district court granted the Department of Justice motion for um, voluntary dismissal of the claim uh, um, of, of intentional discrimination, so the Trump administration does not have to argue the suit, but rejected the argument that the new bill lacking the taint of intentional discrimination would moot the litigation. Instead, the district court, in a rebuke of the Trump administration, continued with the case, reweighed the evidence, and 10 days ago ruled that the Texas legislature enacted the law with a discriminatory intent. Now, the case will likely be appealed, and the saga will likely continue, but continue, and continued litigation will have to happen under the auspices of the NAACP, the Brennan Center for Justice, or the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. But what this court decision represents is a limitation on, 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 on Trump and, his, and the Department of Justice to limit their protection of voter rights. But it's still an important move that the Trump administration made because it is the federal government that has been the primary protector of voting rights in the past. And without them in the game, minority voting rights are gonna be under threat over the next, um, over the next three years, three and a half years. Three years and 265 days, I suppose. <laughs> Nor a final aspect that I'll conclude on is relates to the court, and that goes to the nomination and confirmation of Judge Gorsuch. The nomination and confirmation of Judge Gorsuch might have huge implications for voting rights. Judge Gorsuch's record on voting rights is a pretty thin, but if he follows the path of Justice Scalia, um, he will not have much interest in protecting minority voting rights. And so if the court decides to hear these cases revolving cha involving challenges to restrictive voting rights legislation, um, it's likely that these cases will not, uh, these um, cases will not be reviewed favorably to minority voter, minority litigants. And finally, hopes of revisiting Citizens United, the case that opened the spigot of money in politics, uh, being reviewed and revisited and, and overturned are, um, are, are, uh, uh, is, is unlikely. Um, what we'll likely see is, um, to the extent that the court does take cases in the campaign finance realm, an upholding of future laws that might um, um, limit contributions to campaigns. And if that happens, the campaign finance system is completely, um, 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 uh, will be rendered completely inoperable, and money will be freely flowing into politics. So I think I'll stop there with that most depressing of notes and allow you all to provide me with the optimism. Thank you.